My name is Julie Pearson Little Thunder. Today is September 6, 2014, and I'm interviewing Sharon Atwan Harjo as part of the Oklahoma Native Artist Project sponsored by the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at Oklahoma State University. We're in Oklahoma City, where Sharon is packed for a move to Santa Fe. Temporary move. Sharon, you're a Kiowa tribal member with numerous accomplishments, including being the 12th Miss Indian America, earning a degree in higher education, and working as an educator in the public schools for many years. You started painting professionally in the 70s when Native art was male-dominated, and you were an early experimenter with ledger art. I think you helped open the door for other Native women painters, and thank you for taking the time to talk with me today. Thank you. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Carnegie, Oklahoma back in 1945, January 6th to be exact, and uh, my father worked for the Bureau of Indian Affairs and so we were move, moving around quite a bit. I've started school in Washington, D.C. I started school in, U in uh, Fort Duchesne, Utah. And then I started school in Anadarko, so all these moves. I was very young when I went to Washington, D.C., and they didn't have room for me in the public schools, in the class that I was supposed to be in, so I started the school there when I was four. Wow. But that's, that's where I pretty much, and they ended up in Billings, Montana, when my dad was transferred there when I was in sixth grade, and that's where I graduated from high school. Um, what did your folks do for a living? My father worked for the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, when he first started in his career. He was a soil conservationist. And you'll be happy to hear this. He went. To, he was an OSU graduate, but they were Aggies back then, I think. Uh, but he was in. He was an agronomist, and so when he started his career, he was a, uh, in soil conservation, and then he went to training. And he's. I guess the big bad word in those days was relocation. He was a relocation specialist, uh, working with Indian people across the country. And when we moved to Billings, he became a tribal operations officer and worked with all the reservations in Montana and then the two in Wyoming, and he was the, their tribal operations officer. When he finished from there, we, they came back to Oklahoma, and then he retired in out of Muskogee, but before that he also worked with the Creek Nation and the Cherokees, and I think it was the five tribes that he was working with in the Muskogee area office. Okay. My mom was a homemaker. All her time with us, but it, she was an excellent craftsperson, a uh, seamstress, and knew how to do a lot of things, and a wonderful cook. Too bad I didn't catch on to me. I did my brother's <laughs> sisters, but not me. <laughs> I, had, I have two sisters, and I have two brothers. Uh, two of them have passed away. Um, my older sister lived in Billings, Montana, and she was the line officer in education for the Bureau of Indian Affairs for a number of years. She was in education as well. I have a younger sister, Deborah, who lives in Mountain View, Oklahoma. She was uh, the editor for the tribal paper for a number of years, and then she's no longer doing that, and she does her artwork. She's a beadwork specialist as well as a pretty good painter and drawing person. Right. And then I had, I had an old, uh, a younger brother, the oldest of the two brothers. He passed away, and he was a computer specialist, uh, techni technician. And then I have a brother, Hardy, who worked for Southwestern Bell for a number of years. Now he's also uh, living in, in uh, Mountain View, and he does artwork as well. What was your first exposure to Native art? I don't know. I guess you can tell by looking around here. <laughs> I, it was just stuff hung on the wall, you know, and on the shelf, and just grew up with it. I didn't know it was Indian art. I didn't know it wasn't art, you know, at that point, but it, it was always there. We always had it in, in the house, so. That's, and I just remember drawing, you know, when I was little, we'd always have tablets and dad and mom would say, okay, here's some paper, draw, color crayons are my favorite. That's what I was going to ask, what your first memory of making art yourself was. Mm -hmm. But I've tried to t learn things, you know, sometimes teach myself some things that I maybe wanted to know, and then I had a lot of good teachers as well, so it's always been there. Um, you mentioned all your different moves around the country. What kinds of exposure did you have to art that stand out for you in elementary school? I know you were several places. Yeah, I was in Anadarko, and like I said, I you know I didn't know that it wasn't there was anything different. <laughs> so I was always exposed to that. The murals on the wall of the post office always was intrigued by those. Uh, when I was with my family in Washington D.C., of course we went to the Smithsonian. And, remember all that and mom and dad always made sure we got to the museums 
had that experience of had, looking at artwork or being part of something that was going on a festival or an event. That's what I that's what I remember growing up with my brothers and sisters. It was always there. How about middle school or high school? Any outstanding art experiences that you remember? I won my first contest when I was in seventh grade. <laughs> we great. had we had to do an illustration for the Nutcracker uh, Suite, and my my drawing won, and that was that was exciting because I, I had never entered a contest. Very the first exciting. One I won. What school you, were you I at? I went to Lewis and Clark Junior High. Can you believe that? <laughs> and and our friend uh, Jackie Seaver, I don't know if you know her. Yes. Do you remember her? Yes. Uh, she went to the same school, but she was years behind me because she's quite young still. <laughs> but anyway, we went to the same school and uh, that's just really kind of, so kind of fun to know that you know there's some people whose paths crossed and we're still crossing. You know? Right. But that, and then high school, I had an excellent art teacher. All through my, all through my high school years, I had the same art teacher and um, he was a commercial artist before he became a regular school teacher, art teacher, and he was an expert in oil painting and so forth. So I had that kind of experience with him. And then I uh, did a lot of artwork for some of the organizations I belonged to in high school, so had that experience as well. When did you sell your first painting? Oh gosh, not until I was old. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't sell anything until, yeah, you know, I went to Bay Cone after high school. I didn't sell anything until 19, about 1970 when I started. I really hadn't sold anything up to that point. I, I don't know, I just never really thought about selling it, I guess. But, you know, it's 1970, and I even tell you who I sold it to. It was to the dean of the law school at OU. He was my first collector. And this is the time when they used to have the mall shows, the Shepherd Mall when it was a big shopping right. mall. <laughs> they had those shows, and, and then the, the, the different places in Tulsa and there in Oklahoma City. That's where it started. How did you decide to go to Bake Home? Was your idea you were going to get into the art program? and That pretty much was it, but uh, one thing too, my, my father and mother had a, had a connection to Bay Cone early on in their family too, and as well as some other people from Western Oklahoma and, and even Montana, the people that we knew. And uh, I wanted to go there, first of all, because there were Indian students there. It wasn't totally Indian, but there were Indian students, high population and enrollment. And then the other thing was Dr. Richard West was the teacher there, and I wanted to take classes from him. My, all of my siblings and myself were all graduates of Bay Cone. My dad was on the advisory board, I mean not advisory, on the board uh, for Beckham and then also for the Monroe Children's Home, he was on the board down there, so there was quite an involvement. I think I got a very good education there, you know. People always say, oh, it's just a junior college back then, and, but it had a legacy of, of uh, wonderful art connections and it's helped me over the years in my career. What kind of a base do you think you got artistically from Beckham? Um, as far as academically, uh, it was very, it was, it was, I, they expected a lot of us, <laughs> not just in the arts, but it, it, in all our classes, in botany, in the chemistry classes, and the math classes, and so forth. And being the kind of student I was, it was, I thought it was difficult, but I made it, you know, it was, it was all right. And there, I know some of the other kids who were there, they had some difficult times too, but, you know, as far as art classes, they were just excellent. Um, I had a good background, like I said, from high school, coming in there with oil painting, and to this day I don't like to oil paint. <laughs> not because, not because I don't like to paint, it's because of the mess that it makes, you know, and I don't like to fool with all that, that kind of stuff. Uh, so I was very thankful when the acrylics came in, that they wash it up and right. put it away. <laughs> but uh, as far as my teacher, Dr. Richard West, you know, I could ever thank him enough for taking the time to to teach me what he knew and and sometimes you would get just kind of down on yourself you didn't think you were doing good enough but you know always come back and encourage you to do do what you needed to do and uh, he was just a good person and he knew my he knew my folks you know and one of the things that he gave me one time was a, a picture he said I've got something to give you I want to take you over here and show you this and he brought out this picture of these Indian men who were the deacons at the Rainy Mountain Church. And he said, I found this, and he said, this is your grandfather right here. I said, yes, it is. <laughs> he said, well, I want you to have this picture. And it was a photograph from early on. And so I took that to my dad and my dad and then put it in the Rainy Mountain Church. And it's there now. Oh, it's, wonderful. That was a nice gift from him. 
And then when I got ready to leave, I guess I need to tell you this story about when I got ready to leave. Graduated in 1965 from Bacon. It was junior college, so I have an associate's from Bacon. And um, I got ready to leave and we're closing up shop and so forth to get things to go. And um, Dr. West called me aside and he says, and there was really not anyone else around, you know, just a couple of other people. He said, I need to give you a gift, a parting gift. He said, I want to give you a set of brushes. Some of them are used, but most of them are brand new. And he said, you have a career waiting for you. You need to paint. He said, you, you're, you've got it. You, you'll make it. You'll be all right. And I said, well, I appreciate what you do, but I still have those brushes, and I still use them today. I didn't set them aside on a <laughs> but I still have the brushes, and I still use them. That's and wonderful. He said that uh, when the kids come in, he knows that there are students who are very dedicated to what, you know, learning as much as they can about what they need from, from the art. And that um, he watches you grow, I guess. He would watch us grow, and then he would encourage you to do this, and then, you know, there's a lot of people who come out of Bacon, but there, I, I think there were a lot of people who excelled and it met his expectations, so that's what I'm trying to say. It's not just me, but there's other people. Well, I was wondering if there were a few of your classmates at Bacon we would know from that time whose names would be um, familiar. I don't know if you know Sandra Peters, Sandra Turner Peters. She's a Creek, Muskogee Creek. She was a year ahead of me. Um, there was a Navacoya young man, but he was a cousin to Dr. Tate. And he he's he's no longer here. Um, I was trying to think who else was there. Were. Some of my friends who were excellent artists, they were in the Vietnam War, and so they never came back. So you mm -hmm. know, it's just yeah, so sad. But you know, the legacy before that, there's Ruthie Playlight Jones and and uh, Fred Beaver and right Al Mama Day, and there's <laughs> just a lot of people, new names that you can just reel off. And then my my adopted sister Virginia Stroud, who went just a semester to Bacon, was also. Joan Hill. Right. Um, you got a Bachelor of Arts, I guess, in arts education at NSU. What drew you to that degree, and how much time elapsed between the two? Amos. No. <laughs> <laughs> Did you meet him at Bacon? No, I met him at Bacon Ride, and he he went to Northeastern. And after I finished at Bacon, I went to Colorado Women's College, which I find very interesting. The little story you told me about right. you attending the same right. school. Uh, I went to. To Colorado Women's College. How did you land there? I landed there. They gave me a full scholarship, but the opening door to go out, the, <laughs> out from there was uh, I was missing to America that year, so I could only my contract only allowed me to go first semester, so I just went one semester right. to Colorado Women's College, and when I finished my year with Miss to America, then I went to Northeastern. I decided to go go there and finish my degree. So I, when I went to Colorado Women's College, I was majoring in art, so that's how I got. Into the, into the art scene of that. <laughs> Did you learn anything there artistically, or? <laughs> That's not nice for me to say <laughs> this, but uh, I had this one art teacher. She was an, an older teacher, and she just knew everything about Southwest art, which I did learn a lot. I could name all the pueblos back then. I can't name them now. <laughs> not that I. But she she was really interested in the Southwest art, and and so that's why I, I wanted to. Learn what I could from her, but mm -hmm. I guess it didn't stick. But that's about how, about it. And then I went to Northeastern and took my classes of drawing rocks and sticks and stones in the creek bed there that runs across Tahlequah campus. And, um, finished there. And also knew at that point, I guess, that you wanted sort of a teaching degree. I did. I went ahead and, and took the classes for to get a degree to teach art. But I also got... Uh, heavy into the history, world history, and so forth. That's excellent teachers. And I, I had to take Oklahoma history, which a lot of the kids didn't have to, but I had to take it was a state student. And I had the one teacher, he was, I mean, he was just excellent. I, you know, the stories that he would tell and talk about how Indian people made Oklahoma, and, mm -hmm. you know, he was really good. And, and that's how I became more interested in the, in the history of world history. And, United States history. So, so I had it also was able to get a, I could teach the history classes too, which I have done. I taught social studies mm -hmm. for a number of years. Mary Jo Watson has a nice chapter uh, on you in her book about women painters. And I was struck by a comment that you made that because you were university trained and because you were going to teach, 
you got a lot of support, not just from your family, but also from the you know, tribe in terms of encouragement. And I wondered if you would have had the same support um, if you hadn't become a teacher, if you had just said, I'm going to be a professional painter, that's it. And there wasn't that sense that you were going to pass on these skills. Because weren't, there weren't a lot of Kiowa women out there painting when you graduated. I, I think the encouragement I got from the tribal people was something that, I don't know, it just became, it came easily from them. Because if you did something, they were always willing there to you're doing a good job, your mom and dad would be proud of you, your grandpa would be proud of you, you know, so it was a family obligation that you want to continue that. As far as university training and so forth, it was, um, I think that kind of helped, but I don't think it would have deterred me because they, they would make you feel good anyway, you know, <laughs> that you were going to be doing that. But it was a difficult time to, to get back in, to get into the art as a painter, you know? and that's why I, I do still paint under an auto and hard job because it was a time when you just really couldn't walk into a gallery and say, I would like, you know, 30% or you would like 40% or 80% or 50%. <laughs> Whatever they wanted to give you, they were going to give you whether who you were, you know, and that's not, you even not less even sometimes when you were a woman. And yeah. sometimes they wouldn't, ha wouldn't handle your work because you were a woman. Was there this discrimination coming more from gallery owners than your fellow artists? Right, because the fellow artists were very inclusive. So um, so the Philbrook Indian Annual was going on when you were, it was in full swing when you were painting. Can you talk about one of your experiences with it? Yes, I, one in particular, you know, it was a juried show, so sometimes you got in, sometimes you didn't. And um, I think the last time when I entered I entered a piece, it was uh, one of our stories about the tornadoes mm. and the, the Kaaba people, and it got rejected. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know why, why it did, but they never, you know, but Bernard Strickland was, was the part of the jury, I guess, or was the jury at the time, and he bought the piece out of the reject room, so he has it in his collection, and there was another piece, it's called uh, that I have, that I made, it was, uh, it was a panel, but it had clay face, faces on, on it, and they were making, um, pointing with their lips, mm -hmm. you know, and you school mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, I did that piece, and that was one of my pieces that ended up filming. It did get in that show, I remember, and it was on one of the calendars, that they, Indian calendars that they had. So even though he had juried the show, I want to get this clear, <laughs> and you hadn't made it into the competitive aspect, right. He bought it in All the right. reject room. That's right. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where the painting is now. He could very much have it or maybe sold it on the market or whatever. Who knows? <laughs> right, right. Um, you had a one-woman show really pretty quickly at Southern Plains Indian Museum in 75. How did that show impact your career? I, I always thought, you know, if you were in that, you were in that, museum in particular, then you made it somehow. <laughs> I always thought, oh gosh, it was good to be in invited to be a part of that. But uh, the person who bought my first my first painting at one of these mall shows back in the early 70s was pretty m much instrumental in getting me started from there because he was he was there when it opened and I just, he was standing at the door when they opened that morning, so I don't know what he was looking, but he, oh, he came and looked, you know. And purchase some things, but I always thought, you know, if you make it at Southern Plains Museum, then you got it. <laughs> right, and you have, it is, it's a, yeah, it's it's a, a good place. watermark. Um, uh, Indian Fair, American Indian Exposition um, in Anadarko was thriving too. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit and why it was important? Okay. As far back as I can remember, I always went to the Indian Fair, I guess that's what they call it. Uh, that's what I call it, an in exposition, and I always wanted to enter in the show, you know, when I was starting to paint and, and so forth. And, and uh, again, so even as a young girl, as a young, you were... I wanted to do. You know, they didn't have children's art or anything, so you had to be an adult or, to be in. But I remember all the nice paintings and so forth that came through there. But when I became eligible to do it, I did. I did. It was like in the seventies, though, too. Someplace around like seventy one, seventy two. That I entered into the show, but was was able to get a nice prize out of that, and I and I like you know 
I like that. It was kind of a goal in my life, and yeah, it was met. So, yeah, was good. so you were you won first place in painting? Or? I won best of show. Best of show. Yeah, that's fine. wonderful. That's wonderful. Uh, was uh, what's another award that you're particularly proud of that you've won for painting over the years? I wouldn't say painting. <laughs> or <laughs> oh, well, okay, in I, any I, I, medium. In the medium. Yes. Okay. You remember Mavis' story in our different yes. right? Okay. She she asked me. Um, if I if I would like to learn how to make baskets because her son Scott knew how to make baskets and she didn't have a daughter and she said I want you to learn so that you can you can uh, you know, teach this in in your schools and so forth in Edmond and I said okay I would like that well anyway I made I made a basket uh, for a show that was at Aspen Colorado which was sponsored by the Smithsonian and so I. Uh, I won the basket category. <laughs> yes, I, I remember being amazed to read that and saw that you had painted, is that I, right? You yes, had painted, painted the sides of your basket. Of basket. So you were right. able to combine both right. interests. Well, they're over here because I'm still trying to put them away. We may look at one later. Yeah. Great. Um, who were some other artists you admired at that time in the 70s who were painting? I think that probably the most important person to me um, back in those days was was someone who encouraged me to be a part of part of the art scene and that was uh, Dr. Tate Navacoy. And it's because he always made sure, you know, if there was a show coming up or if he was gonna be in a show and he knew that there was a space he would say, I gave him your name and they should be calling you, would you like to do that? And I said, Yes, that would be good. And he was always including my name somewhere along the way, so he, he helped me, you know, and he encouraged me to do it because he knew that there weren't a lot of women, and I guess because he's Comanche and I'm Kyra, right. we're neighbors, <laughs> so uh, he he was really good to, you know, help help that way. Um, some of the artists from the Bacon School of Art, you know, Fred Beaver, Terry Saul, Simon McCombs, Ruthie Jones, uh, they're all some people I admire an awful lot. You know? And Joan Hill, mm -hmm. her. she was always encouraging. You were in the Daughters of the Earth show, and um, I didn't realize that you also doc moderated the documentary that OET. Oh, I don't remember that. that. <laughs> That's good to know. I read that. <laughs> well, good. Yeah, probably did. I just didn't. It was an interesting show. Can you talk about it a little? Yes, it was. It was a good show, and Virginia Starr probably we can uh, give her credit for coming up with the. Sh with with the whole show and getting it where it was. She lived in Colorado at the time, so she had a lot of uh, friends who were in the galleries and so forth and the museums. And so she got our show together. It was Oklahoma women artists. And we went to several of the shows. Um, I don't even remember how many. You probably don't know this. Yeah, and they, there they were nine se or showed several places around yeah, the country, yeah, I think. Yeah, it was in Colorado and, and Nebraska. Georgia, Nebraska. Just different places, and we got to go to some some of the places. We had to pay our own way on some of them. Some of the other, they sponsored us. So right, it was good. It was it was a good show, you know, because it did focus on the Oklahoma Indian women, right? Not just Kiowas or Cherokees, or right. It was quite a mixture of people. The business aspect of art is sometimes the hardest to get an artist to get a hold of and I'm wondering how you knew how to price your work in the beginning. Even to this day I, I like to do my artwork so it's affordable you know I don't know if people tend to think the success is is how much money you pay for something or how much you can get for it but I, I just want it to be affordable and enjoyable and sometimes it's free. <laughs> Depending on where it's going and who it's going to, or, or anything like that, but I right. just want it to be affordable. And of course, I'm not I'm not opposed to anyone commissioning a piece or saying I like that. I would like to use that. Can I pay you to make a print of it so we put it in a book or blah blah, you know, whatever. Right. But I I think good art is affordable. What role uh, has your husband played when you've gone to shows or? We can not. see <laughs> how it is around here. It's just that uh, he does his share of what he thinks is important, and he, he really likes the OU football team, and he's a runner. And so our lives are, I guess, parallel rather than intermix so much. You know, he would 
he's such a good person as far as taking care of things around the house, cuts the grass, trims the hedges, uh, runs the vacuum, does the laundry, folds it, puts it away. That's, gosh, nothing that's for me a help too, it. yes. <laughs> <laughs> nothing for me. And then he was a really good father to, to our child. Really. Um, Oklahoma's gallery scene developed quite a bit during the 70s and I was wondering what galleries you might have showed with during that time. Okay, gosh, can I even remember the names? Of course, Doris Leto, the Oklahoma. Uh, what's Oklahoma? Yeah. Oklahoma Indian Art okay, Gallery. That's right, okay. Uh, I'm a Jean Mag was probably, she and Oh, she you and Doris. did I'm a Jean's yeah. shows. Okay. Yeah, Doris and I'm a Jean worked together at the at the fairgrounds, at the mm -hmm. the big round building there. What's it called? Oklahoma Arts Oklahoma Center. Arts Center. Right. Yeah. Okay. When they had that gallery, and then we had there was kind of an annual show that we did, and so I did that one, and then got with Doris, uh, Linda Grieber in uh, Tulsa with her art market. Um, I don't even remember the name of the gallery in Norman. The one uh, uh, might have been Reba Olson. Reba Olson. Reba yes. Olson. Yes. Okay. What's the name that, of that was one? an early one too. I don't remember the name. And then of course OIO right. occasionally would have a show and so I was always doing calendars with them and so forth back mm -hmm. in the day. How important has Red the Red Earth Arts Festival been for you? That goes way, way back, before they even started the actual festival itself. I mean, I remember there was talk of who was going to do and what kind of ideas we wanted to come together and and uh, I remember the very first formal meeting they had at the had at the Omniplex, and I think Mary Jo Watson or maybe Hickory Star was the director at that time. And we had this large room, and it was like a brainstorming session. So everybody had their little input, who wanted this and that, and so some of us stood up. And you know, I'd, I of course with my big mouth got up and said, you know, I think that this is something that Oklahoma needs, and whatever we can do to help you, let it go, and, and let let us help you make it go and then also uh, other aspects like the dance and the, the runs that they have and and just every kind of educational thing that could go with the symposiums and so forth but to me it's been really a good time for me I enjoy it because I'm hometown I want to do it uh, doesn't cost me to go anywhere I stay here and of course I have a house full at that time and and then with my with our child being a dancer she she enjoyed it too, but she also grew up doing the Red Earth show. When it started, she was like maybe eight or nine years old. Oh, she wow. did all the little shows all the way across too. Now she does the Red Earth show with with me as. So, but I've been involved with everyone except one, and I just happened to be out of town with one of them. But I've done every show since then, and probably till they drag me out of there. I guess <laughs> I'll do it. You know, I I'm a firm supporter of the arts in, in here in Oklahoma City. I really want I want Red Earth to to keep going. And it will with the people, you know, wanting to do it. So it's been a good show for me. <laughs> How did the um, Indian art landscape change like from the 70s to the 80s, do you think? I think there's still that discussion of what's traditional, what's contemporary. I think that's something that people are still wrestling in their minds. But I mean, to me, uh, traditional is very contemporary, but it's ever changing. You can you can make the subject matter change with you, or you can still be traditional with what maybe has happened historically in your tribe or uh, with your own people or so forth. But I think that Indian connection with someone like myself who's older and who's a full blood, you know, I'm, I'm a four-fourths Kiowa, and there's not too many of us anymore, and that's what I, what I see, you know. Your work can still be traditional, but it still can have a contemporary feel as far as the use, the technical skill, and so forth. But of what you're trying to to uh, show in your work, but that debate's going to go on forever, I think. And and be, I, I my favorite one is, oh, I don't want to be called an Indian artist. Well, I you know I don't know any other thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard for me to say that I'm an artist. It really is. <laughs> I that sort of brought up for me the um, you know remembering your ledger art, and I think the fact that you are actually into it fairly early. I mean, it's very popular right now. It's had a comeback. But I was wondering when you first started doing ledger art, um, if you encountered any resistance or, and or 
what you tried to do differently when you took it up? Um, there was some resistance, but I think it's from people who don't know the importance of it historically and what it meant to some of our grandparents. My grandparent, Sam Otten, who kept a ledger book, you know, mm -hmm. he was a deacon in the Ray Mountain Church and lived through some of those times when uh, there were some transitional things that were going on and, and that's how I became involved because I had an interest in my grandfather's ledger book and um, I always thought, you know, these are really kind of neat drawings and what they mean. They show the winter camp, the summer camp, and so forth. And just to see, just to see what was going on, was kind of interesting to me. And then, I, uh, when I first started doing this, my dad, you know, I I did this one picture, and he said, "My goodness, that looks like something." I know. And I said, well, "Yes." <laughs> I said, "It comes from a ledger book." <laughs> so it was actually uh, telling the story of my grandmother and so forth. And but then I have a piece I want to show you in 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 a. In a few minutes here, but there was some resistance, and it, and it has to do with people who are not familiar with with the ledger art. Um, there is a lot of it now, and like I said, it, it can and has turned contemporary. You know, uh, with cars involved and dogs and throw pillows or whatever <laughs> in the in the picture. But it, it's it's kind of fun. <coughs> It's it's not as easy as it looks. People say, "Well, that's so naive. Anybody could do that." And it's, I think, if you have the cultural and the historical connection to it, I think it's it's going to come about. But you just can't. I, I mean, I guess you can, <laughs> but it's it's just something that I. There's think. a fe different feeling if you have right. that connection. Even within even within the tribes, you know, I, you know, I see some uh, people who are not really quite as much degree Indian as someone else, what the difference is, what they do is to, mm -hmm. to what someone more, more um, involved tribally than others. Were more than one or two your ledger art pieces kind of inspired by um, your grandfather's book? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have, I have. I had just maybe looked at something and taken maybe a portion mm -hmm. of it and, and put it Put it on paper, and I do most of my ledger. I do drawings actually, and, and occasionally I do, you know, painting. So forth. But, uh, the ones that are in painting are more contemporary, I think, than the than the, than the paper ones and the pencil and ink and paint. But if I'm going to be doing. Right. Did you have the opportunity to travel overseas at all? I have had the opportunity, but I have never gone. <laughs> and I, I am one person who, because I had the experience of being missing in America, I traveled a lot by plane, and I didn't, I never had particularly liked to fly. And my daughter says, well, you just continue yourself contained. And I said, well, you know, I don't enjoy it. And nowadays, I mean, it's like a task to get on an airplane. And so I don't. I don't go out of I don't go out of the country. I probably would if someone would take my whole family, but I mean, in this day and age, I don't think I'd be going. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of dangerous thinking about it, you know, thinking about what's going on in the world. No matter where you're going, you know, if it's in Paris or if it's, mm -hmm. you know, in Istanbul or whatever, it's still to me it's it's dangerous. It's scary cat, I guess. <laughs> you you did Indian market for a while and then stopped. In ninety one, is that right? Why, why did you stop? Ninety two. I stopped because I was still teaching school, and when I started doing Indian market, we didn't start school until after Labor Day, which was excellent. You know, I couldn't, I didn't have to miss any school, and so I just stopped doing it because we started going to school earlier. I think the earliest time that I remember going back to school was like the eighth of August, and there's just no way in the world mm -hmm. I could miss the first. Week I can't even miss the first day because your contract doesn't. If you miss the first day, then your your fringe benefits don't kick in. So it's just it was just a mess. Right. You just and then it became more difficult for me to do because my daughter was quite young. Was ninety two. She would have been fourteen or so, and it was hard to leave her. You know, home. She was having to go to school, and so forth. So I just stopped, and I wasn't making any more money there than I was. Just stayed home. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, it was an experience, and it's 
good on paper, but uh, I, I just couldn't do it because I'm, I was still being in, in come in from my teaching position and I didn't want to give that up just yet. Because I had so many years into it and I just didn't want to stop. And we should talk about your teaching um, a little bit. You taught in the um, Edmund Middle Schools, is that mm -hmm. right? I uh, was in Indian education before I went in, back into the classroom. But prior to that, I taught in Illinois at Jack Benny Junior High. I don't know, you're probably too young to know oh, Jack yeah. Benny is. <laughs> but he was a comedian. And uh, he was from Waukegan, Illinois, and that was my first teaching position. I taught art in middle school. I had six, seventh, and eighth graders. That must have been a, a kind of different play, culture kind of uh, experience. You know. <laughs> well, in a sense, the, uh, because well, I was trained to teach, you know, K through 12, so it wasn't too bad teaching. It's just, I just didn't like the Chicago area. I didn't like living there. It was too cold. It was dingy. The school was excellent. The pay was excellent. But I just didn't like living in the Chicago area. Uh, culturally, it was kind of fun because there were things to do there in uh, Chicago, you know, to the museums and so forth. But as far as teaching in middle school, that was my choice of age group, and mm -hmm. I did that all, all my career. And taught one one year at Concho. I taught school, several years at Concho, and I did. Can you talk I, about the that one? That one, that, one, that was kind of fun. Uh, when we moved back from Illinois, we had to move back from Illinois in, I think it was 1970 when we moved back here, because Amos had to have a cornea transplant, and so they were pretty new at that time. Uh, he was losing his sight, and mm -hmm. so he had two cornea transplants. Actually, he had three. The first one was, I think, in 1971. So I needed to find a job, and he needed to find a job until his cornea became available. So. He found a job at Concho, and that's just about the time right when I think Vietnam was just now ending, or kind of in the middle of it or something, and so there was a position open for him, so he, he took that position. And long in April, I got this phone call from the superintendent of schools, and, and they said, uh, we need you to come because we understand you teach sixth graders, and we have a bunch of wild kids here. <laughs> and they're driving their teacher crazy. <laughs> and I said, well, tell me how many. He said, there's 25 of them. And there were sixth graders. And I said, um, okay, I'll come and see what I can do. That's just a month, isn't it? And that's all. Well, I went, and yes, they were wild. They were the kind jumping across the desk, putting things in the teacher's desk and in her chair and putting gum in her hair. I mean, I'm not exaggerating. They were just, they were just wild. And she was she was elderly. And she uh, they were just taking advantage of her. Mm -hmm. So I went and we got along fine, you know. And that's so why I, I didn't get a contract. I didn't get to stay there over the summer or anything. I just jumped crazy. So they said, "Well, can you come back in the fall?" I'm like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> so I went back and I ended up staying there like four years before I, before I stopped teaching there. But, it was quite interesting, and would you believe the kids that I had in the sixth grade that were so wild now have, are there in their late, they're in the middle forties now. They're counselors, teachers, policemen. I'm an artist. I'm a welder. That's true. The, and, and then my, in, in fact, one something really interesting. I went to a grocery store in Montana uh, about three weeks ago, right for Crow Fair, and I get in this line. I thought, oh, that girl looks familiar. That woman looks familiar. Well, look, she had a little tag, and it says, Martha, that's her. <laughs> it was one of my sixth grade teens. One of your she's shaking, Yeah, she's, she said, would you like your senior, <laughs> would you like your senior <laughs> discount? And she started smiling. Martha, is that you? She, yeah, she started crying. And she said, I can't believe you're coming through my line at the, at the IGA. And I said, what are you doing here? Because she's from, she's from Anadarko, that she went to Concha. That, you know, she, she, was just, she was one of my cheerleaders and one of my sixth grade teachers, almost sixth grade students. And she just, you know, she lives in Croatia and see Montana, mm -hmm. but I mean, my kids, are, they're everywhere. <laughs> you know, that's, I get that's so excited. Story. <laughs> How did you balance teaching and painting at the same time? Well, we didn't have Tawny at the time, you know, she wasn't, she wasn't here yet. So I, like I said, Amos did his thing and I did my thing. And, and I'm, I'm a very early person. I like to get up in the morning and putter around and do this while everybody's asleep. It's kind of quiet. But I would get up like four in the morning and I would paint. 
until the sun came up or until it was time to go to work and just go on and do it. And I, I would never accept any show unless I knew I was going to be able to do it. And so that's why I never have really done a lot of, a lot of shows like some people. They go here and they go there. You want to be sure you had yeah. inventory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't always have a big inventory. I mean, I do like maybe six paintings a year if I do have six paintings a year anymore. Mm -hmm. But I, don't, I just didn't. I just didn't take the time to do it. I didn't want to stress myself out any more than I needed to. Mm -hmm. um, well, as you've mentioned, uh, you are a basket maker, <laughs> and you're also an accomplished sewer and a bead worker. I was wondering how these might have influenced your painting at all, or vice versa, how your painting might have factored into I think if anyone's familiar with my artwork, it usually they need they know that you know there's some there's a a connection to the women's lifestyle, daily lifestyle, and uh, as far as the beadwork goes, I don't I don't do that anymore. I did when Tommy was little because I wanted her to have kind of clothes, mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. so I I I did that. And both all my female member fam families of the family. Uh, they're all excellent beadwork, you know, I came from my dad's side and my mom's side, just excellent, you know. But I, I taught myself some of the stuff, and then of course my dad taught me some things too, how to beadwork. But uh, I use that pretty much in, in the detail of my work, mm -hmm. as far as the clothing and so forth, that's what I use. Uh, the basket, I did that because Mary was asking me to do, and I did teach that to kids in my class. That was just one of the curriculum things that I wrote into the school curriculum for what I was teaching. And you mentioned why that was particularly effective, I think. It, it is, you know, it, it's something that everyone can accomplish, you know, no matter if they're a little guy or a big guy, and they all have a sense of accomplishment making the basket and then knowing the historical part of it and with Mavis wanting the basketry to continue, that was, that was my favor to her, to, to make mm -hmm. sure that it was taught the way that she wanted it to be taught. And I used her methods, I used, used what she had taught me. Um, the Indian Arts and Crafts Act was passed in 1991 requiring that artists show proof of enrollment with their tribe or be certified, you know, in some way that they can represent the tribe in their artwork. And um, what is your view of the act and its impact? I, I want to, I'll probably step on toes here, but I'm going to say it anyway. Back in the 70s when, when uh, there was money to be had here and there, grants and so forth and there were trips and there were show sponsorships and there were money that people could could just by saying yes to someone they would they would be part of it <clears throat> and that kind of set in the sour point <laughs> to me sometimes mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. who was always first in line it wasn't the tribally enrolled people and so consequently they began to be left out of this and left so when this act came into being, I thought, well, you know, that's a good thing. And again, it wasn't just because you were an Indian, it's because it was a, uh, a market, marketing mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. And that was important because, I mean, when you buy something from Japan or you buy something from Mexico or something, is it says on there, you know. So why not, with this American art, if it's Indian made, should it not continue to be sold as Indian made and so forth? Now people still, to this day, they still get around the door for for whatever purposes they might have, but to me it's just kind of a selfish thing if they are not. And Julie, you being around Indian people as long as, as, long as you have been, you, you know the difference. Mm -hmm. You know, you really probably do, you see it, and I don't like, I don't like to really address that, but I think it's still an important, important task uh, that we probably need to follow through on some things. My daughter, who's museum studies, um, going to be graduating in in May, she finishes up in December, but she is doing her, her thesis, her senior thesis, on uh, something related to this, but from the standpoint of a dancer and an artisan who makes clothes for other people, and in particular people who do the feather work, because you're not even supposed to mm -hmm. have that possession unless it's yours, I guess, right. as, the, as the law reads. But Right. There's there's a split there somewhere along the way that the Indian Arts and Crafts Board 
they are knowledgeable of that and they know it, uh, but they don't want to address it. Where the art, the what do you call it, the wildlife people, mm -hmm. they have an issue too. And I'd like to see them come together so that it can work for, for everybody because there are some people who work with others and so forth who who want to do the right thing and, and so that's why, you know, this is an important task for still being addressed at this day because right. because I need people to keep some of their cultural ways they need they need these things. You know, right. Whether it's in their in their church or whether it's in their traditional upbringing so forth. Right. So that those things still need to be addressed. Uh, but I think it's an important, it's an important act for us to understand more. It's not just to say, "Oh, I don't want you in the art show," you know, because you're not Indian. <laughs> you know, it's not that. It's it's right. it's actually you know, an inherent right. Actually, I think to 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 do and discuss certain things. You know. You served on Oklahoma Indian Arts Council. I think this might have been in the '70s or '80s, and I hadn't heard of it, and I wondered if it still exists. Was it a artist association? It was an kind? artist association, even it would, and it was developed because of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. Okay. And it, and you and you had to be um, a resident of Oklahoma. You had to be a tribal enrollee. Um, and, and it wasn't it. It was an ongoing thing, pretty much like a group who, who would do shows together. And I think there's, even to this day, I think there's some, like I think the Cherokees, have, or they have one called the Southeast Artists Association or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. they, mm -hmm. they still function. And so they have but this one was Oklahoma this City was based. Oklahoma. It was Oklahoma City based because it was, we had people from right. all over. Right. Jerry Ingram's and Lump Burn Take because he was involved back in those days too. Uh, but that was the name I was trying to think of the sort of but anyway that that was then it's been disbanded because the people have passed mm -hmm. who were involved in it. So Right. Um, well, I'd like to talk a little bit about your creative process and techniques in a okay. little more detail. So I'll just remind you that I read Gwash was your favorite medium for a while, and I wondered if that had remained true over the course of your career. As far as the painting is, I like to do the gouache. And um, I like to do canvases too, but because of the limited space and with the little ones here, it's just real difficult to do the acrylic. I have become accustomed to using Prismacolors and uh, and inks, yes, and some watercolor with my pleasure drawings because that's it gives a nice color with the Prismacolor, and you can mix and so forth, just like you can paint with paints. And so I've grown accustomed to that, and I like that a lot too. And maybe I don't know, there's kind of equal now, right? Um, what is your favorite subject to uh, paint or put in a in ledger work? I like to do the stories from our tribe, our, our legends and our myths and so forth. I, or um, just to, to display it as as a story, maybe a record keeping thing, mm -hmm. going back to the, the original type of uh, artwork. But that's what I like to do. Do you um, cut your own mats at all? No. <laughs> I'm so bad. <laughs> I, I know how to cut them, but I don't know. I don't cut them. I have someone else cut them for me. Or if, do I that. Buy them, I buy, uh, if I see a nice price on something that are standard size, I will get those. <laughs> I do and, like bevel maps, mats, though. <laughs> and um, you had a nice little story you shared. Uh, about a gift that you gave to Dick West. Well, when he gave me my brushes, and I knew that he was going to retire. Well, he never really formally retired, but he just kind of just didn't go around very much more because he became ill and was getting elderly, and, and he came to Oklahoma. And uh, I wanted to give him something for being my teacher. So I gave him a paintbrush, but I gave him a, paint, a beaded paintbrush, and he was... He was thankful, I guess, because he couldn't stop saying thank, en thank you enough. But, I mean, I, I was the one saying thank you because it was right. for what he did for me. But uh, it was fully weeded, uh, well, the handle of the paintbrush because right. he had given me. And I thought, well, you deserve one, too. So yeah. <laughs> you only got one. <laughs> <laughs> only got one and yeah. not a whole set. Yeah. <laughs> um, how do you think your painting style has changed over the years? 
I think when I first started painting, we from like going from high school into college, I had to learn how to. I had to learn how to get away from the modeling part of it, where you're shading and so forth. Was taught pretty good the mixing of colors, so I think I've always had a good color sense. I know I don't have as good a color sense as my daughter, but you know it was, it's there. But I, when I went to back home, I wanted to learn the traditional style of the flat painting. And that's where it took some what of a change for me to go from from the shading and using paints to the flat gouache and the poster 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 board and then the acrylic. I still do with acrylic. I still do flat. I don't I don't like to use it to shade. You know, I, it's, mm. for one thing, it takes a lot of time. <laughs> and so I just I'd like to just use a flat color on that. But I. I think I pretty much, I think you can tell my work, you know, yeah. from anyone else's. It's, it's, it has its own, own way of telling you know, who it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how has your use of color changed, do you think, over the years? You know, uh, <laughs> that's a funny thing, because uh, Tony and I had this discussion. Not Tony, when I first started painting, I used a lot of red and, and blue and so forth, kind of traditional colors with us. And then... Um, when the 70s came into being, when all the big turquoise jewelry and the pinks and light blues and so forth, or salmon color were pretty popular. Then I went through that phase. Uh, then I went back to the more bright colors like yellows and oranges and so forth. Just real intense color. In the 80s and uh, now back to the drawings and the, with the ink, I'm just using black and pencil and prisma colors and they're going but with the mixture of yellows and blues and reds. Interesting. That's, yeah. It just it kinda of went there to there to there to there. Yeah. Do you so you're still doing um sketching first or sketching is a very important part of Um on some things I do and sometimes I just start out. I just go for it and just let it happen. You know, I know with my canvases, I pretty much have an idea what I want to do, but I will sketch it on the canvas and then and go from there. But as far as a gouache painting, I do a drawing, what I think I want it to be, detail as I get, and then I transfer that to my tracing paper, and then I transfer the tracing paper using graphite paper, which is a hard thing to find these days. <laughs> Back in the day, it used to be carbon paper, <laughs> you know, like on the top of uh, but that, and then I go with the paint from there, and then I put the detail in with the paint. But it's quite a process for me. Yes. What is your creative process from the time you get an idea? Nowadays, usually I just think I want to do something that I have seen that's kind of unusual, or maybe in particular to a tribe. Um, I think it might be kind of fun. Like I've always had, I've had actually these three three paintings. I did one, and I, the other two I haven't done yet. One was the one that I finished, and the, and the reason I'm saying this is there's a man in Kansas City who bought this painting at an auction. He said I bought this picture, and it's of these cowboys, and they're holding some kind of money up in the air. And I said, Oh, my gallop, my my gallop picture, going to the Navajo Fair picture. Yeah, he says, What are they doing? And I said, Well, when you go to the Navajo Fair, which by the way is this week, this weekend. You see all these people just dressed up like you know cow new cowboy clothes or their new new velvet skirts, and they're standing on the side of the road because they don't have a car, and they'll be holding five dollar bills up to catch a ride to the Navajo Fair, and they're just you know, and you see all you know thirty forty people down this highway from Gallup to to Window Rock, and and I said that I always wanted to do a painting, and so I did that one. The other one was is my 1970s picture about being at an art show and David Bradley kind of got in on this one <laughs> already but I, it's, I still have it out in the garage that I did the sketch of it but it's being at the Oklahoma Indian Art Show uh -huh. yeah this is an Oklahoma Indian Art Show uh -huh. where all the women Indian women are by their paintings and so forth trying to sell the artwork and, and of course the Indian man the Oklahoma Indian man <laughs> the Indian artist got all these blondes hanging around him you know just standing with the pipes in their hand and just the guys smoking, you know, or having the pipe, just not smoking, but having the pipe in his hand. <laughs> but anyway, it's a whole scene. But I think David Bradley did something like that with the Lone Ranger and all kinds of 
famous people in it. But anyway, I have that somewhere. It's going to get done one day. Oh, that sounds cute. <laughs> oh, that'd be great. Yeah. And then, I was think, what was the other one I was going to tell you about? Mm. I can't remember. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's usually from experiences that I've had that I wanted to do. And you don't necessarily keep a notebook or anything no. like that. I, I do have, I have, I'm like any other Indian artist probably in, in this state. I have sketchbooks, but there might be one page in each one. <laughs> so whenever and whoever gets my papers, you're going to have to have a stack of sketchbooks about this tall. Maybe one drawing in it. I have saved my, my uh, transfer papers. I have them in a box that I told Tony. I said, those might be of some interest to oh, someone yeah. someday. Mm -hmm. You know, but uh, that's what I... When you when you um, were painting, what was your creative routine like? You kind of mentioned you were a morning person, but you had, did you have a little a routine? Mm -hmm. I know people always find this kind of hard to believe in me, but I do pray for <laughs> guidance, <laughs> uh, and that's part of the routine. No matter what, when I start, you know, it's gonna make sure it comes the way that it needs to come. And uh, I leave my stuff <laughs> where I'm painting. I do dump my water because Tony was such an inquisitive child. She would turn things over sometimes or come in and try to use the paint. You know, she never damaged anything that I had. But she, she, and she still talks about to this day that she would stand at the, at the door. She'd knock, you know, the door might be ajar or something. She, are you through yet? Are you coming out? Can I get up? <laughs> I would think this is probably a process of all the all the children that of the Indian artists. The here. women artists. Yeah, <laughs> mama, mama, mama. You know, it's just. But uh, she would do that to me. But uh, I would just leave things. You know. And when she did come in there, sometimes she got into a, a jam, <laughs> in more ways than one. Uh, but that was part of the routine. But I would just leave leave it in there. But as we began to grow as a family in here, we, I had to kind of put things away. So, that's, but the, as far as I would always try to have, if I had any kind of paperwork, I would have it close by. If I needed a book, I'd try to have it close by. And you know, some artists they really worked well with music. Well, I didn't. <laughs> I just I wanted quiet. I just wanted to be quiet. And my my overhead light that I use and. So, Nowadays, magnifying glasses, big old thick lenses. <laughs> I'm always amazed at your husband how how wonderful his work is. Little, you know, so. um, you mentioned you you do have something you're looking forward to. It's not necessarily an art project, but something coming up here that you. Right. I on occasion do. I have worked as an adjunct professor. And I'm in Santa Fe, and Tony, Tony, she's, she's. I don't think these people know who you are. And I said, Well, so much the better. <laughs> I said, I'm not anyway special. She said, Well, you're my mama, and I know what you do, you know. And I said, Well, yeah. But Linda Loma Hefta teaches classes out at IA, and she said, Sharon, would you come and teach my class? She said, I barely touch on ledger art, and I think it's really important. And I said, Yes, yeah. so I will do that. She says, Well, it's going to cost me. And I said. Well, maybe lunch or something. <laughs> you know? But I'm kind of looking forward to to having a, one of her classes to, to talk a little bit about Ledger because I know they are probably familiar with, but they don't really know. Mm -hmm. Maybe someone that does it, you know. Yeah. And I have been so thankful. Um, about two years ago, a book came out called For Contemporary Native Artists. And I was included in that. Richard Pierce from Wheaton College wrote the book, and um, that was something that I we worked on a long time. We started in, in 2008, and worked over the years. And just two years ago, it came out. I think last year we had a book signing scheduled for for Santa Fe and, uh, at one of the museums, and uh, that's been out. And so that's been that's been a good a good experience for me to be in, in the book included with Linda Hawkins and, and two other artists. That's really so, exciting. Yeah. All right, well, um, we're going to look at your work here in a minute, but looking back so far, what's been one of the pivotal moments of your art career? 
Yeah, she has been so many things that just have, have made me really happy and proud to be. But I, I think being recognized by my own tribe as an artist, you know, even today when I go to Carnegie or Grand Mountain, it's, oh, you're the artist. Or, you know, if I tell people, oh, you're the artist, and I say, yes. And I'm getting pretty close to 70 years old, and being in a situation sometimes, knowing that there was a period of time when, let's say, Lois Smokey was recognized as, as producing artists, and then there was a span of nothing. No one was painting anything. And then I come along <laughs> in 1970, which was, was that, 40 some years ago? And then now there are, I, I would like to see other Indian women painters. Still not a lot of plains women who no, are painting. No, not at all. You know, there's one young lady that's coming up. I think she's going to be fine. She's a good, technically skilled, and she's got a good background. And that's Barry Belindo and Arlene, Arlene Poulon's daughter, Antoni. I think she's going to be fine. And it, it's, it's just knowing that you are part of that history that's real important to me. Mm -hmm. And that when I'm, when I'm out of here, hopefully someone will remember me <laughs> for whatever, for whatever reason. <laughs> No, they will. When, what was one of the high points? I, I, I think one of the high points that, that it is involved uh, was knowing that my grandparents, um, both sides of my family, had instrumental part in uh, rearing their children, and it became my parents and the expectations that we had as family members of what to do and how, how to get where we were going and if we met those goals and that was, that was one of the high points in my life was being Miss Indian America and going back to my art. You know, most of these competitions have some kind of talent presentation that you have to do. Well, we didn't really have to do it publicly, but if we chose to, we could somehow work it in there. And So I took my artwork and that was why I was I thought that was really important in my life because it helped me become part of something that that I enjoy doing my artwork, mm -hmm. but yet I was still represent, representing the Native people at that time. That was in 1960. Let's see, I, was, I can't remember. 68, 60, 60, I, believe, I think 65. 60, 65, right, yeah. 1965. Right. Um, but I had, at that particular uh, pageant, there were five judges, and two of them were artists. One was uh, one was uh, an artist from Montana, a lady who wrote some books about Western art and Native art, mm -hmm. a rancher, uh, and uh, let's see, was it? there was a businessman, and then the Father Peter Powell. Oh. Are you familiar with Peter, yes. Father Peter Powell? <laughs> He's still alive today, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. But anyway, all those people were so instrumental in my achieving that one goal that I had set in my life. And just last year I went back to, to Wyoming with the, we had a reunion of the Miss Indian Americas. And there were 13 of us there, some of them have passed on. But it was kind of a very enjoyable time mm -hmm. and getting to see some of the people who were part of our lives back then. And, and these women have gone out to become lawyers and doctors and so forth. And so it's a good sisterhood, but it's still involved with the arts. And while I was there I had a, a I had created this one ledger drawing of some women dancing, and so I gave that to the committee who comes from the library that's named after the rancher that was in, the, in the <laughs> my judge. So it's wow. all connected together. But anyway, they they uh, they created a book of Missing in America reunion, and and so my picture is on the cover of it. So that's been real kind of fun to have one of my paintings on the cover of a book. Okay. And then the Cradle Board book that we did back in, back in 2000, I think it was 2008, 2009, the lady who wrote the book was the daughter-in-law of one of the judges, and she's really instrumental in the Native American artist, Barbara Hale from mm -hmm. Half and Red from Museum at Brown University. She's retired now, but she, she's been a lifelong friend, and she has helped me extremely with as much as she could do for me is my career. 
you know, going back east and being part adjunct professor at, at Brown and so forth. So it's right. Just, so it's all connected, but that, that's the highlight. You know, it's, my missing in America year was the result of my, my folks and my tribal people saying, you know, you, you probably need to do this for yourself. What has been a low point in your career? Oh, gosh. I think saying that the loss of some of the people that are important to me. Of knowing that you're an elder now and that you've, you've lived a good life. I've had a good life, you know, so far. And then I have these two beautiful grandchildren that are my life today. But they're not my low point. <laughs> it's just the loss of all these people who, but they, they are what sustain me, you know, these days. Right. And my daughter, our, our daughter. Well, is there anything we forgot to talk about or that you'd like to add before we take a quick look at your uh, artwork? Let's see what's... Uh, I am so thankful for people like you. <laughs> because, you know, you're there recording this and, and you're asking the right questions and that's, that's really important. You know, in working with Barbara Hale with this Cradle Board book that we did, she said that, uh, you know, she's an anthropologist and she says, that's kind of a dirty word so these days. And I said, well, but with Tani being a museum person, she's, she's kind of in that same category. She's not an anthropologist, she's a museum studies person. And she said, uh, you know, Barbara always knew the right questions to ask, and, and so do you. you know, you're, you're willing to listen to us and to let us verbalize and what we need to, to say to you. And, and understand and you have an insight into to kind of the way we think and I appreciate that and what you appreciate of us and, and that's good. Thank you for doing that for us. Well, now we're going to look at some of your pieces. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this was a commission piece by the Oklahoma Zoological Society and uh, they wanted to do the story of, they actually did the story of bears and they wanted to include a story about a bear from the Kiowa Nation, and so this is my uh, my painting that I put together because when I was growing up, we used to have this um, babysitter who would tell us stories. And she was Kiowa, and she'd talk Kiowa to us, and she would tell us a story. And this is one of our stories about how the Devil's Tower became as it is, and how the Dipper became the Big Dipper, but the children playing, the sisters playing on the rock and the bear scratching the rock to, to get at the, t at the, at the girls. Right. And, uh, and it's done in gouache, It's you done in gouache, it's totally in gouache. It's on uh, a mat board, but the mat board is painted. Mm -hmm. I normally don't paint on mat board, but I did, I did on this one, I don't know why, but I did it on a, a mat board, so. Um, and this is one that I've chosen to keep because I think it was real important. It has an attachment to my, to my growing up. But then also, when our babies were very small, we went to the Devil's Tower. I think it's been last a year and a half ago, maybe last year, and we took them there. And and uh, we the, the youngest one that we have, her name is Georgie Ann, and they always call her Bear Cub because she she lays on the floor and she rolls around like a little, little bear. But when we went there, and she still surprises us because she does some strange things. The way there, she she goes like this, up, and she pulls her arms down, and like she was praying or something, and then bringing her hands down like she was doing the. And when she sees anything with the bear, she'll she'll do the same thing. She'll raise it and kind of honors it in that way. So wow. it's it's <laughs> it's a strange connection. That's but, a connection. Yeah, you know, but I kept this one because it is such an important story in our in our mythology and legends and so forth, so I wanted right. to keep that. When I bought the muslin, I wasn't particularly fond of the lines. I don't know if you can see the faint lines. I love there. the muslin effect. Um, I just happened to buy it. I think TG and Y was still in existence back in those days, but uh, I bought this muslin piece of material and it had lines and I thought, what am I going to do with this? Because I didn't even know it was on until I folded the fabric and I thought, well, I'll just do a painting, a drawing on it. And what I did for this, I was I uh, put my great-grandmother's story. My great-grandmother was a non-Indian. She was captured in Youngstown, Youngstown, Youngs County, Texas. 
1864 and brought to live with the Kiowas through a family who had no children, so she was raised as an only child. And she was brought up into the Mountain View area where she settled. Um, you can see that on the left side there's, there's uh, some pictures of some people. Some right. ladies and then you see a little black face and there was a slave that was part of the family. And actually he was, he was a freed, freed slave at that time and he worked for, the, worked for my great grandmother's family. And what's kind of interesting about their family is she had a trading company in Texas, supply trading company, mm -hmm. um, close to where Newcastle, Texas is. And uh, they were, their farm was, uh, a ranch was invaded by the Kiowas and she was, the little girl was taken captive. She was 18 months old and brought to the Oklahoma, er Oklahoma Territory to be raised by a family, and she was lost for a long, long time. No one really knew who she was because they kept her, they kept her dark. But sometimes if somebody tried to find, find her, they would darken her skin so she would blend in with the rest of, <laughs> rest of the people. But she had gray eyes and real light hair. But anyway, she she lived until 1934 in Mountain View, Oklahoma, at, the, at our old, at the old family home, which is here. And there was an arbor outside, which is something that was pretty common among right. the Kiowa people. But she lived there. My grandma and grandpa lived in that same house until my mom and dad had it torn down. There's a historical mm -hmm. marker outside the Mountain View that, mm -hmm. that shows that this is the home place where she was raised and where she lived. She married, her name was Millie Durgan, and she married uh, an Indian man named Goombay. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where my maternal part of the family comes from, but uh, it has all this kind of the story in here. Mm -hmm. And I wanted it floating on there, uh, on, on this particular, and this is one piece that I've chosen to keep this for my collection too, because it does tell our story, and it used the ledger style. Right. Drawings right. with the ink, and it's none of the ballpoint pen and Prismacolor. There's no paint on it. It's just it's got a wonderful feeling. I don't even really remember what, what year it was, but I think it was in the 80s. But I have a friend who called it my dish towel paint drawing. I said, gee, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> At least you can say you knew me. <laughs> <laughs> right. And a collaboration. A collaboration piece. Uh -huh. Which is, which kind of goes back to the Indian Arts and Crafts Act because there are some people artists who sometimes don't do their own work, you know. And I, I think Red Earth has made an attempt to figure this out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're going to be in the show and then you collaborate, then you both have to be in the show and be juried in. <clears throat> and you mentioned it was a battle dress, which mm -hmm. not all tribes have all. a version of. And the reason she wanted to do one is, I, I don't know if you know Denny Medicine Bird? Okay. He was... He stayed with us a while before he went to the army, and uh, when he when he was gone, she said, "I need to do something." And I said, "What do you want to?" <laughs> so anyway, she said, "I want to make a battle dress, but I don't want to put any army things on anything. She said, I want it to be more traditional." Mm -hmm. She said, "For his safety return." I said, "Okay, well we'll do it." So we did that. You know, when he came back, they had some kind of deal. Anyway. And can you explain just the significance of the battle dress for mm -hmm. the Kiowas? Usually, usually the Kiowas, it was, it was to show the war deeds of the, the warrior. Okay. But, uh, I don't know. Does this one have the flag on? This one doesn't have the flag on. Does it? Does it? I didn't see one. Okay. But. Well, thank you so much for your time today, yeah, Sharon. Well, thank you, Julie, for being here.